So now we're going to take a look at a little Neanderthal anatomy, and most specifically at skull anatomy, because that's where the really significant differences can be seen. So here's a Neanderthal. This is what our skull looks like. This is a modern human. It's a, actually a plaster cast of a modern human. But if you look at them, try not to juggle them here, side by side, you can see immediately, wow, there are differences. And you could express those differences, like this face sticks out a little more. This one doesn't have those big bumps over the eyes. Uh, this one seems long and low. This one seems more rounded. Whatever terms you want to use, and we, of course, have very specific terms for much of the anatomy, and we're going to talk about some of that anatomy. We don't, some of it we don't know what it means or what it reflects in terms of adaptations, but other anatomy we think is related to living in a very cold climate. All right, so if you look at this in lateral view, side view, and you hold it in the correct position. Remember, there was a Frankfurt horizontal, which is from the bottom of the orbit to the top of the ear openings on both sides, and it forms that plane. So that would be the, more or less a proper orientation. And you clearly see that it is a long, look at it from here, you see that it's a long, fairly low, doesn't have a, a rising forehead, uh, cranial vault. The bones you can't tell, but they're very thick. That's also characteristic. And they had a range of cranial capacity or endocranial volume from about as low as 1125 to as large as 1740 cc's. That is well above the average for modern humans, which is about 1400, 1410. Okay, and we'll look at that and wonder, and maybe provide an explanation why their brains were so big, yet apparently they were, in terms of uh, cognition, cognitively not anywhere as advanced as modern sapiens. First thing that you notice are the brow ridges, of course, here above the eye orbits. Uh, there is a lot of face projecting out, which is called prognathism. And on the back, there is this, what's called, this area is called the occipital. Remember, these are the parietals we talked about when we talked about erectus. There's a little bun back here, or the French call it a chignon, which is as a woman makes her, ties her hair in a bun on the back. So those are very obvious characteristics in a Neanderthal. And if you just take a quick look at yourself, you can see you don't have very much face sticking out. You don't have the brow ridges. You don't have an occipital bun. It's nicely rounded on the back. So those are clear differences. In lateral view, you see them even more strongly expressed in here. Here you see the occipital bun. You see the strong brow ridges. And you see a lot of face sticking out. And what's the other thing you notice about Neanderthals? If you look at the mandible or lower jaw, no chin. You can feel your chin sticking out there. And you can see it projecting down here in a modern Homo sapiens. So there is that distinction. They have no chin, whereas sapiens has a chin. Now looking at the anatomy of the face, which is quite startling really, uh, you can see again the strong brow ridges. It's a very large face, right? Look at modern humans like us. We have a very small face, okay? So very large face. And that's partly due to significantly expanded maxillary sinuses. In here, you have hollows. Uh, there are spaces in there. And they had very large maxillary sinuses, perhaps as insulation against the glacial environment in which they were living. They have large sinuses in the top, up here, frontal sinuses, as they're called. And they have a very large nasal opening. Look at, compare sapiens here to Neanderthals. We have a relatively small nasal opening. Neanderthals have a very large one. And inside, there are special structures that we won't talk about. 
But inside of our noses, our noses tend to be wet inside. It enhances um, the moisture of the air coming in. And we think that in a periglacial or glacial environment, the air is very dry. And maybe this was a means of not only making the uh, air moist that's going into the lungs, which is a healthy thing, but also warming it up because it's so cold. So some of these distinctions in anatomy are important. And what those large sinuses do, and it's, you can see it much more clearly in this illustration, if you look down on the top, you see that the cheekbones, okay, actually sweep backwards in a Neanderthal. And you see that very, very clearly over here on this side on Neanderthals. Whereas ours, and you can feel this, they're flat in front and at 90 degrees to the cheekbone. So if you look at a modern human like us, you can see that they're more or less at a right angle, and you can actually feel that in your face. And that's because it looks like the middle of the face was pulled out, partly due to the uh, large maxillary sinuses and maybe to the large noses. They probably had large bulbous noses. Now, what about the postcrania? And we've got, we're, going, we're going over just a few things that distinguish Neanderthals from us. It seems that every time somebody begins to study a new aspect of the bony anatomy of Neanderthal, they come up with another distinction. So there are many, many distinctions between them and us, and many that we are just simply not going to be able to get into. But a, a colleague, uh, Gary Sawyer, uh, at the American Museum of Natural History, uh, decided to, to put together a complete Neanderthal skeleton. Okay, we've got lots of modern Homo sapiens skeletons in collections all over the world, doctors' offices, and so on. But we don't have a composite of an entire Neanderthal. So what he did, and he focused on uh, La Ferrecy, which this actually is one of the, one of the skulls from La Ferrecy in France, about 50,000 years old. And he used that for the, the skull, meaning the mandible and the cranium, as you see. And he's coded this on the right. So you see La Ferrecy. I don't want to drop that on the floor. Uh, you see La Ferrecy, uh, the hands he used. Um, what happened here? Okay. And um, he used other ones like Kabara, which is from Israel. Uh, Sacco Pastore, which is from Italy. Spi, which is from Belgium. Shandidar, which is from Iraq. La Chapelle is from France. Feldhofer is Neanderthal I, and, uh, reconst and uh, some reconstructed pieces, and pieces that he's gotten from modern humans because they're lacking. And he's put together, he's color-coded these, so you can see the green rib cases from Kabara and so on. So he's got this composite Neanderthal. So what does it look like compared to you and me? So on the left, you have a Neanderthal, big, stocky guy. Uh, you see his reconstructed Neanderthal in the left picture. And then uh, the lighter skeleton here on this side is, of course, you and me and uh, modern Homo sapiens. Well, we're more linear. They are broader in the chest, broader in the pelvis. They are bulkier overall. And some other interesting things, and we won't go into details of proportions, but the forearm is very short compared to the top, the humerus. So the forearm is shortened and the lower leg is shortened. And it makes them short and stocky. A kind of body build that is reminiscent of what we see in populations of people who live in Arctic environments, like Aleuts or Eskimos. They have this kind of short, stocky body build. 
we have a much taller linear body build. And when you look, you put, put muscles and skin on that body, you, we have very high surface area to body mass ratio. So we are heat dissipators, means that our ancestry crafted our bodies in a warm environment, read Africa, right? Whereas Neanderthal's bodies were crafted by natural selection to adapt to a cold environment, which was periglacial glacial Europe. And they're rounder and stockier and are more adapted to the cold and their heat conservers rather than heat radiators. And that distinction becomes very clear when you look at complete reconstructions like this and explains some of the anatomy of adapting to those colder environments. Now, there are a couple of homo sapiens in this picture. It's kind of a fun picture I put in taken at the American Museum of Natural History where the original reconstruction was done. Ian Tattersall, who was recently retired as curator of anthropology there, is considered one of the world's experts on Neanderthals. He's a great example of a homo sapiens, tall and linear. And uh, you can see us standing next to those two skeletons. So we know from the paleo environment, the research, the kinds of animals like woolly mammoths, woolly rhinos, uh, other Arctic adapted animals, and from the geology and so on, that Europe during the Pleistocene, as we talked about it, when Neanderthals were living there, went through a series of glaciations. So you have to give Neanderthals credit for surviving those cold environments while we were still restricted to Africa. And uh, this, this, some of these glaciers were miles thick and uh, so much water was locked up at them. You can see just here that there was a connection with the British Isles. The English Channel was uh, actually closed and, and animals, including humans, could walk back and forth. And again, you see that is restricted to Europe and, and Russia. It also happened in North America, right? We had ice ages, similar ice ages in North America. They were given different names than they were in Europe, but they're about the same time. And uh, it didn't affect people here because people didn't get into the New World till probably something like... 20,000 years ago, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in uh, our next week's lectures. Uh, so look at some animals that reflect this kind of physiological adaptation. Animals that live in hot environments, like this particular rabbit or hare, has long limbs and a long linear body to dissipate the heat and be able to live in the desert, okay? Whereas a cold adapted hair, like this arctic hair, has short limbs and a round body. So it seems to work, doesn't it? And that may be why Neanderthals and us look so different because of the environment in which they lived. I can mention briefly, were Neanderthals burying their dead? There was something called a flower burial in northern Iraq, northern Iraq at Shanidar, excavated in 1957 by Ralph Selecki. There was this partial skeleton with some uh, healed arm injuries. So obviously there was some compassion. They were looking after each other. It was called the flower burial because lots of seeds of flowers were found with them. They thought, oh, they put flowers in. But someone came along and said that this little rodent, the Persian jurd, has a habit of burrowing down into the ground and storing seeds. And that's probably the explanation. I don't think they were burying them with fossils. We have good Neanderthal children good Neanderthal children fossils, I guess. Uh, here's one uh, from France, a three to four year old, and already at that age, 50,000 years ago, they're beginning to develop brow ridges. They don't have a chin, for example. And there are other features that are clearly Neanderthal. And in Amud, Israel, we have a beautiful skull from uh, the site of Amud, which is the largest brain on record for Neanderthals. It's called a Mud One. It's about 50,000 years old. And recently, a few years ago, the Institute of Human Origins team, working with Yoel Rack, who is one of our collaborators, uh, an Israeli anatomist and anthropologist, 
went back to Amud and excavated this nine-month-old baby. And there are certain features in the mandible, the lower jaw, which I'm not going to go into, that are only found in Neanderthals. So you can see that this is a genetically based series of anatomical differences, that even in a nine-month-old, you can tell if it was a Neanderthal. And this beautiful skeleton uh, called Moshi, 60,000 years old from Kabara, Israel, fascinating in one way because it's, there's so much of it there, but where is the brain case? Where is the, the, the cranium? It's not there. Was it being curated? Was it being buried somewhere else? Was there some ritual involved? Anyway, just a glimpse, a little glimpse of behavior that we're going to talk about so much in our next presentation.